Warning, the following podcast contains profanity, but probably not enough. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock, Aura Frames, and by my new idea for a business, pornographic book covers for hotel Bibles. Pornographic book covers for hotel Bibles. Because if you didn't want obscene covers, you shouldn't have venerated such an obscene book. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Oh, welcome to the stage, Mary Rose, a queer from Indianapolis. She grew up in a Duggar-ass family of 10, has been to the Creation Museum five whole times in her life, and at 28 is in her second year of public health college. She can assure you that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men like her father Tom. It's March 7th. And this podcast gave up on Lent before it was cool. I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Henright. And from Jason Alexander's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the Pope drops the mic on trans children. Hinduism and Islam have a very serious dispute about lion nomenclature. And we'll learn that Christians have a pretty ordinary set of skills. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. The underlying problem in America right now is that there's a bunch of mediocre white dudes looking at an honest definition of bigotry and saying, well, if you define it that way, even I'd be a bigot. And then think of the problem lies with the definition. And while I'm sure I could be describing any number of people you've had to interact with online or otherwise, the mediocre white dude I'm thinking of is Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. See, back when Obergefell was decided, he penned this snitty dissent that basically translated that misconception into legalese. His chief concern was that in protecting the legal right to same-sex marriage, the court would force the government to treat people like bigots based solely on their religious belief that being gay was a sin. In other words, he was worried that Christians would be labeled as bigots based on nothing but their bigotry. Now, to be clear, this is not a new principle. While it may have been new to apply that legal distinction to homophobes in particular, the government always treated people as bigots regardless of where that bigotry came from. If you like refuse to rent a room in your hotel to a mixed-race couple, it wouldn't matter that your opposition to interracial marriage was biblical. You'd have violated the law nonetheless. But the legal playbook for Christians right now is to act like this is some sort of novel imposition on their sacred liberties as soon as it's applied to LGBTQ people. And just in case there was some homophobic Christian warrior that hadn't got the message, Alito said it loud and clear from the bench last week. The whole thing stems from a case that the court unanimously declined, but Alito felt the need to issue a, but if we did take it, here's what I would have thought statement regardless. So, so here's the case. A woman who worked for the Missouri Department of Corrections sues her employer when her boss retaliates against her for fucking his ex. She wins. Right. The court finds that the department didn't respond appropriately to her complaints and they had to pay her a bunch of money and say sorry like they really meant it. But in advance of the trial, three jurors were excused for no reason but that they openly admitted prejudice against gay people religiously. The jurors were asked if they belonged to a religion that taught them homosexuality was a sin. And when three of them said yes, the judge agreed with the plaintiff's attorney that obviously you couldn't expect them to render a fair judgment for a lesbian whose entire lawsuit revolved around a same-sex relationship. Well, one of those prospective jurors turned around and sued because she's Christian. And the sense of Christian entitlement is fucking boundless. She said she was being excluded from civic participation because of her religion. And of course, we're like, no, you were being excluded because you were a bigot. It doesn't matter where the bigotry comes from. So she appealed. Uh, now, at the appellate level, this was dismissed on technicality, but in a manner that I can't help but equate to asking to speak to the manager's manager, she appealed to the Supreme Court. And they were like, yeah, the fucking technicality still exists at our level, too. And they declined to take the case unanimously. But Alito still felt the need to weigh in. So he issued a five page fucking, I don't even know what it's called, a precision. 
Anyway, he issues this statement saying that it's a goddamn travesty that these jurors were excluded and that this was exactly the kind of thing he warned about in his descent to Obergefell. That thing being, of course, gay people having rights. See, the sleight of hand here is subtle enough that a lot of people actually miss it. But what Alito and all the other Christian nationalist judicial warriors are doing is they're swapping out religious status for religious belief. Well, our eyes are on the lovely assistant or the flash paper or whatever. Excluding somebody for their religious belief is fucking nothing. Right. That happens constantly. And it always has. If you were going to sit on a jury, say, for uh, like a death penalty trial, they would always exclude you if you were like a Quaker who doesn't believe it, like who has a religious belief against voting to send someone to their death. Nobody objects to your exclusion, least of all Sam Alito. But all of a sudden, when we're talking about his bias, this is a fucking travesty that must be curtailed. Alito argues, presumably with a straight face, that these jurors could have rendered an impartial decision regardless of their bias. An argument that he wouldn't even bother to consider if the bias was motivated by any other thing and wasn't one he shared. Because what he's arguing here is that religious bias is better than those other biases, that religious people can uniquely transcend above their bigotry and remain dispassionately logical, irrespective of it. It's a delusion he shares, unfortunately, with damn near every mediocre white guy I've ever met. And it's a delusion that Sam Alito, no doubt, needs desperately cling to just to get to sleep every night and to wake up every morning. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the corn checks and wheat checks to my rice checks, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to square off? I am. Checks, notes, ready, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hey, we checks are the only checks I don't bounce at this point. Go. So I was right, excited right. just to, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, on this sad reflection of just how bland my post coronary diet has become, we're going to pause for a word from this week's first sponsor, My Sheets Rock. 40000 in de icing costs? Heath, Eli, will, will you guys get in here? Hey, hey, no, what's up? Wait, what are all these charges from the Orlando Live show? Oh, he's talking about the nap zone. Nap zone, yeah, for sure. Okay, I'll bite. What is the nap zone? Okay, does that get a point just now? No, no, they're not the sponsor. Nap zone's not the sponsor. Yeah, right, right. Uh, no, so you see, no, Heath and I are warm sleepers, so we had no choice when visiting a city as muggy as Orlando but to rent our own ice truck. Look, guys, nobody understands the pain of being a warm sleeper better than me, but why don't you just try the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? Oh, what are the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? My Sheets Rock created the regulator seats, which are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, stay breathable, and they're so soft you'll sleep comfortably every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, which transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. It's true. My Sheets Rock sent us a set to try when they first became a sponsor. And since then, we've bought three more sets. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse My Sheets Rock. I don't know. What if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Their 2,200 five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing and enter our code scathing for 10% off and free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com slash scathing, code scathing. All right, Noah, thanks. But hey, sorry about the extra costs. No worries. It all goes towards my debt for the eventual Amsterdam show. I don't think you need to build up a debt in advance, right? Oh, trust me, Heath. I, I do. I do. Got it. And now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, Liberty University, the most restrictive thing ever to be named after freedom, was fined a record $14 million by the Department of Education on Tuesday for violating federal laws on campus safety, leading many to say, holy shit, apparently the Department of Education can issue fines. Look out, Ron, the fucking Santas. <laughs> and by the way, in addition to the 14 large, the university also has to spend an additional $2 million on improvements to campus safety to bring them in line with said federal laws. Yeah, it's expensive stuff. You got to get a bunch of bouncy castles to put at the bottom of every stairwell in case Falwell <laughs> Jr. comes back to campus all drunk. Yeah. His right. safety's important. Let me, let me help. Guys, it's give me liberty or give me death. Or... <laughs> 
common misunderstanding. So this all comes from a two-year-long investigation which the education department summarized in a 108 108- page report that details a shockingly nonchalant attitude towards student safety or even their own fucking safety. Highlights include failing to issue timely warnings about criminal activities, failure to notify the campus about emergencies, and failing to maintain a complete crime log, which means they literally tried to reduce their crime statistics by not writing down all the crimes. <laughs> cool. The Enron model of university yes. safety. Right. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive and forget is not the policy you want your educational institution to have. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. No, of course, we've talked a lot about Liberty University on this show, mostly as it pertains to their drunken, abusive, insufficiently clothed cuck of a former president, Jerry Falwell Jr. Yeah, he's all those things in a bad way. Everybody. Well, right. Yes, know, yeah, no judgment on the general, but on him for sure. Well, yeah. the abusive part, yeah. But Okay, yes, that. Okay. We, we've <laughs> also talked about Liberty's abysmal safety record, especially as it pertains to keeping female students safe from sexual predators. Now, the university has gone to great lengths to convince everybody that the real problem was just Jerry Falwell Jr. and that all the issues left when he did. They've gone to defamatory lengths, if you believe Jerry Falwell Jr., which he's never given you any reason to do at any point in his life. But regardless, it's sure. clear from this report that there is still plenty of work to do. Yeah, most of that $2 million they have to spend is motion detector lights in the corner of every dorm room to make sure he's not lurking there watching you fuck. <laughs> it's right. that in the bouncy castles. Yeah, honestly, what's clear from this report is that J. Falls II is just the most public sex pest to thrive at Liberty yes. University, but by no means the worst. Right. Now, for their part, Liberty University played the role of chastened and penitent and, and pointed out that they've already spent $10 million since 2022 in their efforts to be compliant with the laws at issue here. And they think that makes them sound good, but it's actually an admission that after spending eight figures in a desperate scramble to reach compliance that began after the Department of Education's investigation began, they're still at least a couple million dollars shy of minimal legally required safety requirements. <laughs> There are 108 pages of report away from right. minimal safety requirements. Yes. I mean, it's honestly, it's hard not to imagine Liberty students trying to make their way to class through a gauntlet of swinging axes and agitated chain <laughs> chomps. <laughs> okay. You could give everyone a tanuki suit and the power to become <laughs> invincible like a statue. But if your view of women is based on the book of Timothy, it's not going to be enough. It's yeah. not going to be enough. Yeah. yeah. It's also worth pausing to point out that one of the reasons parents send their kids to universities like Liberty is to protect them from a world that they perceive to be full of sin and dangers. And as is almost always the case with private religious things that don't have to follow laws, they end up doing the exact opposite of protecting their kids. Yes. Again. Right. And look, when their crimes are rendered in language as anodyne as failure to notify campus of emergencies, it's easy to think of this as like clerical oversight type shit. So let me give you a sense of the scale here. The previous record holder for the largest fine ever issued by the Department of Education was against Michigan State University over the Larry Nasser affair. He's the doctor that sexually abused the school's gymnastic team for fucking eons, right? That fine was $4.5 million dollars. So the shit Liberty was doing was, in the Department of Education's estimation, more than three times as bad as that. Whoo! Yeah. And in putting the con in conception news, a new bill in West Virginia would force all students in their public school system to watch insane anti-choice propaganda videos as part of their science curriculum about human development. The bill is called SB 468, or the Baby Olivia Act. And it's named after one of the propaganda videos called Meet Baby Olivia that's been described by most major organizations of medical professionals as approximate, quote, fucking stupid and you're lying. <laughs> the video claims a sperm touching the outside of an ovum is a baby, named Olivia, I guess, that has a heartbeat six weeks later, despite very literally not having a heart six weeks later. Well, but the beat comes first. You know how like, you know, how, like in Christopher Nolan movies, sometimes the music kicks in before the scene change. So, you know, it's coming. It's like yes. that. Or it's the backwards time thing like Tenet. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait till you see the version they have to show in Alabama where baby Olivia and her friends are frozen at the IVF clinic like <laughs> Sylvester Stallone and <laughs> Demolition Man. 
<laughs> so during the debate session for that bill, a Democrat made the argument that lots of Jewish people, among many others, don't believe a sperm touching an egg equals a baby. And after a very long diversion during which somebody clarified what was meant by Jewish people, we got to hear from GOP state <laughs> senator, Christian nationalist and uh, redundant neo-Nazi Mike Azinger, who spoke up to defend the bill. He started by saying, quote, it's essentially an absurdity that all Jewish people believe that lifehood, for lack of a better term, begins at another time other than conception. What? Um, just to be clear, a better term would be life, I suppose. Right. I don't know why <laughs> you would say lifehood like a crazy person there. Li life in this? Yeah. Ah, the English language has its limitations. <laughs> he, he continued, any Jew... Really bad. Don't just say it out, man. If you're don't just say any Jew. If you're There's Mike no Azinger, <laughs> say Jewish people. He said any Jew who believes the first five books of the Bible would, by definition, believe that life begins at conception because Genesis four one says, and Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived. There, right there. End quote. Right, right where. Mike, are you not clear? What what are you are you sure you're not just dealing with a case of stupid hood for lack of a better term? <laughs> right. So, so to be clear, Mike was sitting in his seat and heard people talking and he was like, damn it, Jews are wrong about their religion again. Yes. I got this. Give me a second. <laughs> let, me, yes. let me explain the Jews what they believe. Yeah. And just for the record, the Talmud says that life begins when the baby's head emerges from the mother's body. So according to that sincerely held belief, it is, in fact, your First Amendment right as a Jewish person to do a beheading style abortion on any baby that's born feet first. Sure. As long as you keep the head inside during the guillotine Ouch. procedure. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Also, none of that matters. Also, about 85 percent of Jewish people support uterine autonomy. Yes, as do the majority of theists in general in America, as do the majority of Americans in America. Yep. Well, great, Noah. Now Mike needs to explain what being an American means to an American. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so from there, Mike Azinger kept talking, and sadly, he ruined his very cogent anti-Semitic tirade. He continued by saying, quote, all of a sudden, we have a lot of senators who are all upset and worried about accuracies in science class. But evolution is a quickly dying theory what? that many, many understand to be an absurdity in and of itself just because it can't pass the first test of first cause. So this is a great bill. It shows conception. And Google it. At the very nanosecond of conception, there's a flash of light. What? When conception occurs. <laughs> when conception occurs in human beings. And I believe it's across the whole animal kingdom at the point, the second of conception, there is a flash of light. That is God telling us that life begins there. And exact quote from an elected official. Why would any of that mean to, it doesn't even, it's not true and there's no therefore and then God shows up. It's If, if the only bad thing religion ever did was inspire this idiot to run for office, that would be enough to justify our show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be clear, if someone said this aloud on a subway, I would change cars. Yes. And this guy is using it for why the law he has proposed should pass. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a terrifying uh, West Virginianism, for lack of a better term. But my favorite part is the story behind the flash of light thing. And great work by Hemant Mehta for explaining this over at the Friendly Atheist blog. That's how I learned this. Apparently, a bunch of evangelicals latched onto the flash of light thing after a study came out in 2016 about the activation of ova by sperm. There's a release of zinc around that moment, and the scientists were able to track that by putting ova in a fluorescent solution that binds to zinc. And under a microscope, oh. you could see the zinc light <laughs> up. There, Amazing. There is not, however, a giant old-timey flashbulb that goes off whenever an <laughs> egg is fertilized across the entire animal kingdom. If God was setting up a sign about abortion policy, um, no, he wasn't. Yeah, right. No. right. Nope. 
But I do love that Christians now have an image of their head of God taking a selfie with all of his children, like a Jewish grandparent, yeah, right. just like, um, <laughs> right. one second, the flesh was on. How do I, I got to push the light. The lightning is the, oh, I want to make it an X. Okay, no lightning, please. <laughs> and quick, before the headlines reach their third trimester, we're going to cut them off for a word from this week's other sponsor, Aura Frame. Hey, podcast listener, as you may or may not know, our Orlando live show allowed my mom to live out every grandmother's greatest dream, taking her grandchild to Disney World. That's right. Like threesomes for dads and owning a boat for sad uncles, the life of every grandma reaches its peak the moment they step foot inside the house of mouse with their grandchild. And thanks to Aura Frames, Grandma doesn't have to forget a second because Aura Frames is the digital picture frame she doesn't know she always wanted. It comes with unlimited storage and simple controls on the frame so you can upload as many photos as you want and mom can pick her favorites to see more often. Plus, you can set it up so it's ready to go right out of the box. No explaining technology to mom. Right now, you can save on the perfect gift that keeps on giving by visiting AuraFrames.com. For a limited time, listeners can get $20 off their best-selling frame with the code SCATHING. That's A-U-R-A Frames.com, promo code SCATHING. Terms and conditions apply. Aura Frames. Because when grandma gets a win... She deserves to remember it forever. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. It's not every week that I get to open this segment with good news, but I want to start tonight with a tip of the beret to the good people of France, who became the first nation in the world to enshrine the right to abortion into their constitution. And when asked why they did it, they pretty much just said, well, we don't want to wind up like America now, do we? And in a tantalizing vision of what we could be as a nation if we weren't so damned religious, I should point out that this wasn't exactly a tight vote. Of the 925 members of parliament that could vote on this, 780 voted in favor. That's just shy of 85%. And when the bill passed, there was uproarious applause and they lit the Eiffel Tower up in celebration, which really makes you wonder what those abortion is murder assholes must think of French people. And make no mistake, this is a historic thing. France's prime minister told the people gathered to celebrate the law's passage, quote, we are haunted by the suffering and memory of so many women who were not free. Today, the president must respond to history. To enshrine this right in our Constitution is to close the door on the tragedy of the past and its trail of suffering and pain. Let's not forget that the train of oppression can happen again. Let's act to ensure that it doesn't. End quote. And while France is making historic strides in the field of women's rights, what are we doing back here in the good old U.S. of A.? Well, the biggest stride I could find for us was that a pastor in North Carolina who said that a women who wear shorts deserve to be raped later admitted that he was wrong. So, yeah, this is the story of Pastor Bobby Leonard of the Bible Baptist Tabernacle in Monroe, North Carolina. He was giving a sermon talking about the previous weekend that he spent leering at women at an outlet mall and counting to see if more of them wore pants or shorts, which is already plenty creepy even before he adds, quote, if you dress like that and you get raped and I'm on the jury, he's going to be free. Well, a clip of that shit went viral and all of a sudden he saw the light and decided that maybe he should walk his endorsement of sexual assault back a bit. First, he said that the sermon was taken out of context. And I was like, well, if you wanted people to have the context, why the fuck did you immediately delete it from your website? But eventually Leonard did apologize. By then, he'd basically deleted his and his church's entire social media presence, so his apology was limited to a reader board outside the church that said, quote, I am sorry for any hurt. I was wrong. Pastor Leonard, end quote. And before I let you go, I have to highlight one more story for you, because last Tuesday, Brian Houston, formerly of Hillsong Baptist Church, sent out a tweet that simply read, quote, ladies and girls kissing, end quote because he apparently thought that bit was a search bar, which is fucking hilarious. But as is so often the case when a Christian idiot falls into a trap of his own making, Houston's desperate flowing just keeps making it both worse and funnier. 
16 minutes after the original tweet, he deletes it and tweets out, quote, I think my Twitter may have been hacked, end quote. Then he has an assistant tweet out a lengthier, yeah, it was definitely hacked statement, perhaps hoping that his excuse would be more believable coming from a woman. Then he had her tweet out another tweet reiterating that excuse, along with a partial screenshot of an email saying that his Twitter account had a suspicious login attempt. Though the screenshot fails to contain any information about when that happened. So he almost certainly had someone try to log into his account suspiciously so that he could have this excuse. All so that he didn't have to admit to looking at the most anodyne possible excuse for porn. So while we all take a minute to appreciate the fact that we atheists get to watch porn guilt-free, I'll wrap things up for you and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in another Nope from the Pope news. One of the weird things about talking about atheism for a living is that far more often than people talk to us about God being real or that bigots are simply acting out the perfect word of the creator of the universe, you get asked to give out trophies to non-bigoted religious people, which is a weird thing to do about a definitely harmful set of ideas, mm -hmm. right? Nobody ever asks us to concede the self-confidence boost racism gives people or the financial opportunities afforded to home invaders. And yet, every time a religious figurehead says something remotely progressive, we, atheist activists, are expected to trip over our own dicks in a rush to praise them. And perhaps there's no figurehead for whom this is more true than Pope Francis, who, since his inaugural triumph of not having been a literal Nazi, has been a media darling matched only by the time we all decided we liked the Tiger King guy for a second. What? But the Pope is not progressive, and he's not an ally. As he reminded us in his own words this week when he called gender theory a, quote, ugly ideology that threatens humanity. Threatens humanity? You gotta have some stupid fears that don't threaten to end human existence. I know you have some medium stupid fears. Just be <laughs> honest, this is crying wolf. Yeah, so big thanks to Lilith for sending us this story over at scathingnews at gmail.com. I don't think it was the apocryphal demon queen that sent us the latest atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com, but maybe it was. And if you send us atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com, maybe she'll answer your prayer and steal your ex-husband's penis. Worth a shot. Anyway, addressing participants of a two-day conference in the Vatican on the evolving role of men and women, according to Christian teachings, the Pope was actually too sick to deliver his own speech. But it was so important to him to shit-talk gender theory that he did a little bigot TLDR to sum up his feelings, and then he had an aide read the rest of his actual speech. So here's what he had to say, quote, I have asked that studies be carried out into this ugly ideology of our times, which cancels out the differences and makes everything the same. Adding, canceling out the differences means canceling out humanity. He said uh, while trying to cancel out a part of humanity in a speech. Right. First of all, maybe have the studies about gender theory start with learning the meaning of gender theory. There you That'd go. be a good start. <laughs> Starting with Webster's Dictionary defined that would have been that would have been a better study if they did it like yep. that at the beginning. Yeah, but that's not all. Pope, frankly, my queer, I don't give a damn also had a book recommendation for us, and it was the 1907 doomsday literature <laughs> Lord of the World, a book written by a Catholic priest about what would happen if there wasn't any religion. Uh, look, guys, our social views haven't significantly changed since 1907 when the only places in the world women could vote were New Zealand, Australia, the Isle of Man, and the Grand Duchy of Finland. So I, I th I'm i pretty <laughs> sure this is still good. I think we're still, good. It still counts, yeah. It's evergreen. So yeah, next time you see some front page news that the Pope said gay people can ride the bus or eat food at all, just please remind the people around you, especially if they're praising it, that the Pope is not social justice's friend. If anything, he's the boss it must defeat at the end of the game. Yes. And finally tonight, in big catastrophe news, <laughs> <Pat>. <laughs> given the intense sociopolitical conflict in the country of India between the religions of Hinduism and Islam, the nation's court system 
is constantly dealing with extremely sensitive issues that have real life consequences for about 1.4 billion people. Also, there's a lion with a Muslim name and a lioness with a Hindu name at a zoo. <gasps> and they were living in the same enclosure, likely engaging in constant pantheist orgies of spiritual debauchery of lions. And that's why the Calcutta High Court spent their real time in real reality as grown-ups and professional legal scholars considering what to do about this very serious Jeez. problem. Fucking cats and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> Say it's a problem of meow sedgenation. <laughs> <laughs> and a big thanks to Stormy D for the link and for catastrophe. Scathing news at gmail.com. So this all became a court case when a Hindu nationalist group called the VHP heard about the brazen uh, religio miscegenation of cats at the Bengal Safari Park. Sorry, meow segenation. Yes. Thank you. According to their official complaint from the nationalist group, a lioness named Sita, named after the amazing and very real Hindu deity, was living with a lion named Akbar, named after some fucking bullshit Muslim thing. And <laughs> it's not just any Muslim thing. Akbar is the name of a Mughal emperor who was known to be pretty secular for his time. He had a bunch of Hindu friends, and he even married a Hindu lady. And that is unacceptable if you're a Hindu nationalist. They're claiming it's blasphemous, and it's hurting the feelings of Hindu people all over the country. An official for the VHC said, quote, Sita cannot stay with the Mughal Emperor Akbar, <laughs> end quote. People of our religion are deeply invested in who a uh, cat fucks. You're not taking this seriously enough. <laughs> we demand to be taken seriously. Okay. Yeah. I just want to want to clarify. If the lion had the name of a more devout Muslim emperor, they'd be okay with it. Probably not. More okay? It's hard to say. So the origin of the lion naming is also a big part of the argument. The VHC is claiming Akbar the lion was originally named Ram after another Hindu deity, the husband of Sita. So it was all good. But then Ram got moved from a park in the mostly Hindu state of Tripura to the current park in the more Muslim state of West Bengal. And that's when West Bengal authorities renamed the lion Akbar for spite. West Bengal <laughs> responded to that by saying, no. That was you. You guys changed the name <laughs> to Akbar. <laughs> All right. How's this for a peace offering? We renamed them Adam and Steve. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I know American theocracy is a drag, right? We have careers as a result of it, but at least our zookeepers aren't worried their animal namings are going to set off a geopolitical <laughs> skirmish. You I know, know what I'm they saying? they named them Adam and Steve, it just yeah. might, man. <laughs> it might. Yeah. We're getting there. So according to the article at Al Jazeera, there's a conspiracy theory popular among Hindu nationalists that's likely to be causing the panic about a Muslim lion potentially mating with a Hindu lioness. That conspiracy theory is called love jihad. It's the idea that Muslim men are trying to destroy Hinduism by wooing Hindu women one by one and converting them to Islam. In response to that conspiracy, several states with predominantly Hindu leaders, have introduced anti-conversion laws and police started cracking down on Muslim men involved in interfaith relationships because they're allegedly doing love jihad. Okay, but love jihad sounds awesome, right? Like, at least it Hindu does. nationalists are better at naming shit than whoever came up with white replacement theory, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but also, how are they imagining that going? Like, hey, I couldn't help but notice you're awfully comfortable here in one of the hottest places on earth with no air conditioning. How'd you like to be in a bag all the time or I'll kill you? <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> Buy a drink? <laughs> all right, so here's where the high court landed on this. They told the Bengal Safari Park, to strongly consider renaming Akbar and <laughs> Sita. They made it clear that giving a religious name to any lion is fraught with peril, apparently. No word on the official renaming yet, but the park has moved Sita and Akbar to separate enclosures to ensure we don't get a Hindu slash Muslim chimera lion. <laughs> and eventually, a shred of sanity did prevail 
And somebody on the high court was like, hey, guys, we all look like fucking idiots. We got to stop hearing cases about religious animal names. So the case got reclassified as public interest litigation, and that means the high court will not be spending any more time on it. And with the sad admission that we probably can't say the same, I suppose we can close the headlines <laughs> for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we won't be the ones encouraging crimes for a change. Ooh. The wonderful thing about Christian cinema is that they can often squeeze feature-length stupidity into a short film's runtime, which is why we're happy to bring you another installment <laughs> of God Awful Minis. So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Taken, the Christian short film that does indeed have like the highest density of stupid ever. It's impressive, like no was saying. It's the story of a guy becoming an armed vigilante and taking an OBGYN hostage. Mm -hmm. it, it's John McHugh. Yeah. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this mini? Well, if you love watching forced birth advocates struggle under basic questioning, but you wish one of them would say, hey, that's a great point for my side of the argument. You will love this mini. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best of being the worst? Best, hat? worst basketball. Oh, my okay. God. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> I was furious. They spend like 35 seconds playing basketball, and they manage to get like more than 35 things wrong. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm amazed they don't kick the ball. Really? <laughs> Honestly. So I was going to go with best, worst blood distribution. Right, so there's a there's a point where a, our main character is going to do some bad shit, and another guy's going to be bleeding, and he's going to have to get out of the car like all covered in that guy's blood. But like the way that they've smeared the blood a little bit on this leg, a little over here, and even it up here is just the most <laughs> unrealistic, ridiculous bullshit you've ever seen. I love it. Yeah, they were making that one tube of stage blood from Halloween Adventure last. You yeah, know what I'm exactly. Saying? <laughs> And I'm going to go with best worst action prep. It, yes. It's just a tiny moment, but I will talk about it. Oh, it's classic. Okay, so we're going to open up and made arrest with a dude on the phone holding the gun going, I can't do that. I have no idea what this is ever about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so obviously this is supposed to be like the Liam Neeson character, and he's doing such a bad job doing the scary voice that Liam Neeson does when he's like on that phone call. So he's like, I have a very particular set of... <clears throat> I have a very particular set of skills. <laughs> yeah, very right. much so. I'm hanging up. I'm going to try again later. Now, can we spoil the twist for this? Because I have questions. Yeah, we have to spoil. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is about a guy whose wife, girlfriend, something. Wife. Gets an abortion without his permission. Right. And the movie is going to make us think that it's about an affair, right? That's That's the twist of the film. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and they're definitely married, by the way. Just in case anybody missed it, she holds up her hand with the ring on it very she clearly. She does, that's Scratches right. her nose for like five seconds to show it to you. But in this opening scene, he says, you need to make this right. And again, given the spoilers, how does someone make an abortion? You, you got to get in here and let me impregnate my wife while we're at this me medical <laughs> office. <laughs> you need it's to confusing. put that baby back together, <laughs> stick that fetus back in there, hook it up. Get all the king's horses and all the king's men. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so then we, we get uh, the title, right? And then we get the wife coming home. Early, and I have her down as just wife throughout the story. I have him down as husband because I don't know yeah. that they get named. I think she's named Jen. I was shocked. I was like, what? Did they like almost pass the Bechdel test? But not really. No, she never talks to a woman. Yeah, so definitely not. not really. No, no. Yeah. They're very much trying to portray this wife as a whore. So they put this poor actress in her like least favorite bridesmaid dress because it had bare shoulders. It's yes. fucking hilarious. I, I wrote my notes. You can tell she's sinful by the spaghetti straps. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so, but she's like, we need to talk. And then we cut outside, like, we watch them talk through the window so that they can do the reveal later, and we don't know what she said, right? Very subtle. But when we cut back in, the husband's just going, how could you? Now, again, we're supposed to think that she just said, I had an affair, and the movie will lead us down that path as much as it can. What she really said was, I had an abortion, right? Right, but when he yells, how could you, she says... I didn't have a choice. And I was like, oh, so 
end of movie? Did you accidentally explain? The, right, the thing that's right. Wrong with yeah, your why, why that would be really bad. Yeah, and he goes like, you know, he starts yelling about what about my rights to your body, you know? And she explains that she he doesn't make enough money. That's her big problem. And again, like, you know, that's a pretty reasonable yeah. reason to have an abortion. I can't afford to have a child is a great reason not to have a child. Yeah. And it's even worse because she's like, yeah, I have a real job and you fucking started a podcast in, as a middle aged dude. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Solid point. Yeah. And he never addresses that, by the way. His instant thing is revenge and not, ah, yeah, you know, I probably should have taken on some weekend shifts. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, she says she's embarrassed by his existence. And I'm like, well, you know, you are several A's out of his league here. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. You are a podcaster. <laughs> and your particular set of skills is, I guess, hair gel based on looking at yep. this guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so he goes, I want to know his name. Again, the movie would have you think that it's the person. But no, he wants to know the abortion doctor's name. Which again, only in the insane fantasy of anti-choice people is there an abortion guy as opposed to a clinic, right, a doctor, right. a medical practice. Yeah, uh-huh. So, but then, he, you know, she yells, you know, like, I need to take care of myself. You sure can't. And I'm like, oh, zing, fucking got him. Got him. Then we cut to him and his pastor playing basketball down at the church. God <laughs> oh my God, I was so happy. So furious. If there was only if only this this movie could like also just gently be making bug noises near Heath's ears and rubbing honey on its face. Uh, this <laughs> this movie is a prank on Heath. Okay, just a couple of examples. I'm just gonna name a couple. I'm gonna okay. I can't do more. <laughs> he makes a 15 footer. And the ball lands back in his hands from the yep. sky immediately. It does. <laughs> Fuck. By the way, that's not that fifteen footer is not in a single take. By the way, no, <laughs> no, no it no. sure is. Separate isn't. cuts, but it was like shoot from fifteen feet, mm -hmm. swish, ball from the sky back straight into his hands. So stupid. And then he he's like, oh, I'm gonna celebrate in my buddy's face, and he does the ball spin on his <laughs> finger for a second. <laughs> <laughs> He definitely injured himself because he like it, for just a second he gets it and then he has to like kind of stretch out all the one side and he almost drops it. And not only does he only get it for a second, but when he does, the ball is out of frame, right? He goes so high with his hand that it's no longer in the camera frame yeah, at all. Just have the ball drop from the sky back onto your finger. I don't know. You're using <laughs> Sure, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then so, you know, his, he's talking a bunch of shit. He goes to try to, like, get by his buddy, by husband, and husband elbows him so hard that he knocks him down. Now, he doesn't actually elbow him hard because they don't want to hurt each other. So, like, you, it, he sells it like a soccer player or whatever when he falls <laughs> down. Which, again, like, a body check in a game of one-on-one -on -one is just one person going, ow, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Ow. <laughs> so... Also, sorry, I'm I'm naming one more. Okay, they're playing one on one, and he makes a shot. He makes a layup, and he's like, "That's two to nothing." Nobody plays one on one with two points for a layup. Maybe you would play with <laughs> ones and twos. The twos would be behind the arc, but there's no arc on this court either. No, nope. it's nonsense. Yeah, every Christian movie trying to do a sport is like Inglorious Bastards with the three fingers thing, and it's yes, just like exactly. yeah, so right. clear they've never sports ever. Now, of course, these these actors can't handle pretending to play basketball through this entire scene. So at a certain point, they like get up and they walk over to sit on the bench for the rest of the dialogue, which honestly, I'm sure like probably is the reason that Heath was even able to join us today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, but he sits down and he's like, Pastor, how could God let my wife do that to me? Yeah, he's like, I've been a Christian for four months. And it's like, yeah, no, it's almost a college semester, buddy. I yeah. can see why you would expect nothing bad to ever happen <laughs> to you again. So, but the pastor's advice, he says, well, you know, what you need to do is respond. Don't react. Like Those are, those are fucking synonyms. synonyms. Those are Literally. fucking nims. Yeah. Perfect <laughs> what the synonyms. hell are you talking about? Not even stretchy. <laughs> So I need I need it. I need him to be like, hold on. OK, I want you to do a respond and then a react so I can tell the fucking difference. Right. Right. What yeah, would that let, be? Let me show you. Let's show me a response that isn't a reaction. I, that's what I need. So but Buddy, who is still, by the way, just desperately out of breath from the 28 seconds of exertion at the beginning of this scene, 
he pulls a Bible out of his bag to hand it to the to husband. And it's like, he just said he's been a, a fucking Christian for four months. He doesn't have a fucking Bible? You're ready. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know you've just been <laughs> believing me for now, but <laughs> time for you to read yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, and then a fucking, I, for no goddamn reason, the janitor comes in, right? And he's like, hey, pastor, can you lock up tonight? Uh, I got to get home to my sick wife. And he's like, okay. They're like, why the, what, what, what was he, the goddamn number one backer on Kickstarter? For this yeah, thing. or someone someone was watching this and they were like, "Who's this fella giving religious advice? He better." Oh, he is a pastor. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, okay. To, yeah, maybe that's. I it. was worried I was going to have to kidnap and murder the maker of this film. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so he gets home. He's all mopey, and now we're going to get Eli's best worst. We're going to get the classic action movie arming up scene done as stupidly as possible. <laughs> Oh my God, it's ama- it's like watching me pack. It's just like, all right, rope. Nope, not rope. Socks. Sock he rope. Gets, he starts cliff with bars. snacks. Yes, he starts with cliff bars and bottles. It's water. the best. He's like, all right, got to get my uh, bag together to do this hostage thing. Uh, I better stay hydrated, though. I'm going to get. Yes, you gotta, I, I might get snacky. I don't want to get snacky. The Brita is empty. Ah. <laughs> I guess I'll take a couple bottles. This is plastic waste, though. I feel bad. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe I'll get some trail mix? No, they I'm going to add raisins. I would genuinely have loved this movie if at one point they had f- closed the circle of the cliff bars. He had been like, you killed... Oh, sorry. One second. Um. <laughs> <laughs> a little snacky. So then he goes to... He gets some rope. He's got some rope there. He, he keeps just two nooses of rope sitting out in his yep. house, apparently. I feel like his wife puts those out for him every morning with a <laughs> yeah, note no. that says, do it, you coward. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got two different colors, you know, for funsies. He was like, yeah, yeah obviously. I, I like that they offer multiple noose colors. And then he grabs this gun, right? And we're like, oh, finally, something that makes any fucking sense. But just so that that's also stupid, he also shakes out like the three or four loose bullets in his gun box. Like the bottom of a Pringles can for yes. bullets. <laughs> he lifts it up. One of the bullets goes in his eye. Ow! Oh. <laughs> and by the way, he keeps his gun in a fucking cardboard box like, yep. like April. Crazy. <laughs> and of course, so he goes out to get in his truck in the garage, and of course, it's a fucking crew cab, right? Yeah. He's sitting in his truck to work up the courage. I really wanted him to stay there too long and die from carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> his wife comes in. She's like, well, the nooses were unnecessary, huh? There you so go. Right. Well, however time. you want to do it. So then, okay, so now we're going to cut to the guy, to his target. This is the abortion doctor guy, and he's they, they want him coming out of his mansion on his way to his car, but they don't have, like rent the use of a mansion kind of money. So he's walking out of like a fucking library or a two-story funeral home or something. Right, that like historic that. house in your town that has like a museum about right, the yeah, town exactly. in it. Yeah. 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 They ran away right after they got this cut, for sure. Right, yeah. right. All right, guys, very important because I, I think I saw what happened in the real universe, but maybe something in the movie universe explains it. Did he pull out his stage gun, shoot the other actor? The other actor didn't realize he was supposed to be shot. So then he shoots again while the director is like, fuck, Chris, he shot you. Act shot. (laughs) (laughs) Or was he supposed to have missed the first time? No, he he is supposed to have missed because there's like a a little chunk of stone that gets kicked up when he shoots. So that's what it is, is that they had that all rigged up. And they're like, you have to miss one time because we have this awesome fucking effect. We have stone stone squib money. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We also have sound effects money for it. It's going to be bink. Bink. (laughs) Yes, yes. Two binks. (laughs) The bullet hits a, a rock behind the guy. Yeah. Yeah, so but the husband shoots this guy in the shoulder. Now, apparently the plan was to kidnap him, right? And he's not a good enough shot to even hit the dude from like, he's like 10 feet away on his first shot. So I don't know what, you know, like he was really rolling a die with this first shot, right? So anyway, so the guy's shot in the shoulder. He's rolling around on the ground. Husband comes up. He's like hovering over him, ready to deliver the headshot. And he says, you shouldn't have done it. Jennifer Williams is my wife. And the doctor guy is like, what is the plot now here? Yeah. Am I supposed to say, I don't care? Are we doing a fugitive thing? I don't understand. (laughs) Well, the guy responds, you can have my money. And look, I know this movie's stupid and it's trying to keep a secret, but I don't think anyone opens a robbery by saying you shouldn't have done it. (laughs) 
Oh, or telling you the name of their wife. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You know, the doctor's like, please don't kill me. He delivers it with all the fucking passion of asking for a refill on his lemonade. But then husband knocks him out with the pistol whip. Right. Bink. Yeah. And then we get my best worst where he drives him out into town and we get the husband. He gets out of the car and he's got the blood all like exactly symmetrically smeared on his pants and face and shit. Okay. But this scene fucking ruled because in this very serious short film, we're going to watch him now not be able to drag a body and use a door at the same time. Yes. <laughs> so he does a fucking Marx Brothers bit where the body flops and then it rolls down a hill and he's like, ay, 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 it's ay, ay, so ay. good. Just like, I'm going to fucking kill you. Ah, oh, it's a tricky door handle. I only have oh, it like comes, my it elbow pulls free. In, it pulls in. Like if it pushed, it would, this would be fine. <laughs> Do you mind getting, no, you're knocked out. Okay. He drops the guy like an infomercial. The guy rolls away in all directions like a bunch of apples or something. Yeah. It's so good. It's got to be a better way. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I love so much about this too is that like most movies, they wouldn't actually make the actor drag 180 pounds of dead weight in a human being across concrete, but they don't know what they're supposed to do. So he's literally trying to drag this, you know, human-sized human along the road. It's not it going like, great. Ow, too hard. Too hard. <laughs> ow. At one point, it seems like he's trying to get away, like he was just going to inchworm his way to freedom. Just yeah. scoochie, 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 yeah. scoochie, scoochie. <laughs> So, yeah, but but he drags this guy up eventually and, and clumsily into a clinic. There's a bunch of nurses, so he orders them all into the small office because right now he's, he's John Q-ing the fucking the abortion clinic, right? So he locks everybody in. He ominously closes the blinds. And then we cut to like sometime later, he's on the phone with the cops outside. Yeah, he's demanding to see his wife. And I wrote in my notes, oh, yeah, she's going to love this, man. <laughs> yeah, right, right. This will do it. So, yeah, but the first words we hear him say, he, he goes, he's talking about the hostages and he goes, they're not hurt. <laughs> yeah, except I shot a guy. I did shoot well, a guy. So I, 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 yeah, yeah. I shot a guy. He's, he's, he's going, ah, I feel like he's hurt. <laughs> so, but yeah, he wants to see his wife again. And then he remembers that scene from the very beginning because they only had that, the money to hire that chick for that one scene in the cemetery shot at the end. But this time we don't, cut out to the window when she has the, like, you know, when she has something to say to him. So we hear that it was, I had an abortion, not I had an affair. Right? Right. Which, to be clear, still not okay even if you had an affair. Nope. Nope. None of this is right. okay. This movie is like, we all know how you would kill someone in a homicidal rage because everyone you've ever stuck your dick into is a property. But what if it was what was inside of her that was your property? Right. Oh. Well, what? so this was actually kind of a confusing reveal for me because this is where I had to first realize that this movie was like trying to fool me. Right, because it was so obvious what was going on to me that I was like, oh, they think this is a reveal. I was supposed to think it was an affair this whole time. Okay. Yeah, it's like watching a, <laughs> a really young child do a magic trick. You're like, right, the box is empty now. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Where did it go? Love your hand <laughs> full of everything. Yeah. What's yeah. the opposite of a reveal? It was like a reverse twist reveal. Yes, yeah, conceal. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. A conceal, yeah. So, and, and then, so, but he's yelling at the abortion doctor. He's like, do you know how many unborn fetuses died at your hand? And just then the pastor guy from earlier in the movie shows up, right? He's there to like, I guess, talk husband down. Right. Yeah. So the, he went to the cops outside and he was like, please, I play one-on-one -on -one basketball for this guy and have been for four months. Please allow me to handle this. Right. And they're like, yeah, okay, sure. So he goes up there and he's like, he's on one side of the window and, and uh, the husband is on the other. And he's like, he says, you know, you can't do this. And the husband is like, an eye for an eye, pastor. He holds up the Bible. And I'm like, well, to be fair, that book is terrible in terms of moral advice. So at least you yeah. are somewhat guilty for having given it to him. See, I mean, it does say that in the book, but I thought the pastor yeah. was going to be like, well, ah, that's... That's the Jewish part that you're referencing. <laughs> I love you got to check Matthew and then like, that's a little bit cooler. But he says, I've heard nice bad. Any Jew will tell you the yeah, five. Right, right. But he's like, they threw my daughter in the trash. I was supposed to teach her to ride a bike. And he's like, that's not how fetuses work, man. Fetuses can't ride bikes. Right. Yeah. Also, I was supposed to take care of her. I was supposed to protect. Okay, so maybe pay closer attention in high school and then you can afford to have a baby. Oh, Feels like your fault. I'm just saying. Also, how does it, why does that matter? Like, no, that's not how it works. There's not like a trash bag and it's burr. But like, 
if the fetus was frozen in carbonite up on the wall, right, it would be yeah, better right, for this right, guy? Exactly. If they had a little funeral, like in Texas. Yeah, and then the pastor's like, yes, what the abortion doctor did was wrong, but what you're doing is also wrong. And I'm like, oh, so we're saying these are equal, the the kidnapping and shooting of the doctor and the performing of an abortion on a woman who wanted an abortion. And the medical care that yes. a person got voluntarily. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, I just got to add that while they're having this really intense conversation, bad guys holding a gun, pastors across the wall on the other side trying to like give him a speech about the Bible— there's a big poster on the wall that says, check up on chlamydia? And I was <laughs> yep. like, all right, <laughs> yes. you gotta just get rid of that for your scene. We do have to check if up on chlamydia. This movie's trying to tell you any one thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's good advice, but like, it doesn't work for the scene. Yeah. Yeah. But the pastor's like, so yes, we do have to stop baby murder, but not like this. And then the husband says, I'm going to do it. And he takes his gun and he puts it to the head of the abortion doctor. And we hear a gunshot, but it's the cop sniper shooting the husband, I guess, which is all the more confusing because the window doesn't break. <laughs> but- yeah, I know how I feel about this. How is the audience supposed to feel about? Are we supposed to be like, oh, man? Yeah. Now he's going to do more abortions. I was like, right. this is fun. I did not see that coming. That guy's dead now. Good. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah happy ending. Yeah. So then we cut to the wife at the cemetery. She sure feels bad about having that abortion now, huh? Or she's like, oh, I don't have to leave out those nooses anymore. This is lovely. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I I, I thought she was just going to squat down, start peeing. Yep, no, that tracks. <laughs> the tracks. Starts fucking the abortion doctor on the grave. Like, yeah, yeah right, this, is funny. this is pretty funny, right? Because I was having an affair too. Yeah. Hey, Christian filmmakers, if your film is directly aimed at guys who want to shoot up abortion clinics, if that population is a part of your audience... That's a problem. That's you problematic. shouldn't have yeah, exactly. that as a right. part of your right. audience. Well, especially if you're going to end on this fucking title card, right? So this title card, we get the cemetery and then the title card comes up and it says, who has the right to take a life? Yeah. End of movie. And, right. And the movie's not sure about the answer because it's just like, no, I could take a life credits. And that's yep. the end. like, is it? Cops? Did they land on cops? Oh, right? plenty of fine people on both sides. <laughs> yeah, right. like that cop, I guess. But that's a weird ending, either way. <laughs> also, I want to point out these credits: complete bullshit. They must have some made-up names. Nobody was the first assistant camera operator for this goddamn no, film. Absolutely not. <laughs> Craig, will you get me a water bottle? Are you going to list me as first assistant camera? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, on that not-quite-incitement-to-murder, I guess we can wrap things up, but I'm sure there will be more socially irresponsible messaging for the next... God-awful mini. Before we tighten the lug nuts tonight, I want to thank everybody who came out and saw us in Orlando last week. I also want to single out the Central Florida Free Thought community for making a big showing. It's a great group. Check them out if you're in the Orlando area. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight, but it will be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Crowd, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday, and an even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't allay your fears that I've been replaced by a scroll unless I thank Heath Enright for reminding me that I do suck at pool. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for reminding me that I could suck worse. And I want to thank the lovely intelligent Lucid Illusions for letting me win two out of three. Sorry, there's a billiards table at the Airbnb in Florida, and I'm still plotting my revenge. Also want to thank Mary Rose for providing this week's Farnsworth quote slash wrestling intro. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's and last week's best people. Maggie, Mara, Shelley, Mark, Jen, 33rd Cookie, Beamstress, Michael, Sunshine, Ken, Sarah, Daryl, and Don, Lynn, Matthew, Not That Matt, Another Matt, Derek, Stilgar, Angelo, Johnny, Tips, Match, Zenit, Casey, Shannon, Stephen, Maurice, Ava, Brandon, Chris, Hypatia, Blunt Force, Llama, Carol, Logan, and Tom, whose wits are even sharper than Binky's claws when he's ready for me to wake the fuck up. Together, these 34 thoroughly thoughtful atheists thankfully thwarted the theist's syllabus this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll only access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, you're saving all your money to buy your way out of the simulation. You can also help a ton by leaving a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. Sorry, I went.
second. <laughs> I thought you I thought you were going to backtrack on the Tiger King comment. I thought you thought about it. And you're like, wait. We didn't like You know what? Him. On second thought, she did I kill I mean, that Carol guy. Baskins killed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Step ahead of me. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.